Okay, so welcome to everybody to the first of our lunchtime lectures for the 2021. And our first presentation this year is by Lynn Wadley, who is an honorary professor of archaeology in the Evolutionary Studies Institute at Wits University. She's a fellow of the British Academy and also the Royal Society of South Africa and a member of various professional institutions here and abroad. Her speciality is the African Stone Age, the Middle Stone Age, 300,000 to 25,000 years ago, and the later Stone Age, the last 25,000 years, with an emphasis on various rock shelters in KwaZulu-Natal. There was something in your um, CV that was very interesting. So that many daily activities of people in the past are approximate proxies for cognitive attributes. I should hate to know what my daily activities and during the lockdown says about my cogn cognitive at attributes. <laughs> but um, this is one of the things that, that Lynn has been studying and she's also conducting various experiments to, to replicate the activities that these individuals would have done. And these rep rec replications enable the interpretation of the cognate abilities of peoples who use these technologies. For example, the heat treatment of rocks, ochre, seeds, hefting of stone tools with compound adhesives made from natural products. I found that fascinating. And so I am really looking forward to your presentation, Lynn. And Lynn has asked that we, we play it from here because the Wi-Fi where she is is a little uncertain. So just bear with me as we put it on. But Lynn is here to answer questions, and various other comments. KwaZulu-Natal boasts a great many rock shelters with archaeological remains. I can only do justice to a few of them. Since my present interest is in Middle Stone Age sites that date from about a quarter of a million years ago to about 30,000 years ago, I shall be concentrating on these, and in particular on two national heritage sites, Subudu and Border Cave. Middle Stone Age sites that I shall mention are marked with yellow stars. The World Heritage Site that incorporates Drakensberg rock art and clusters of later Stone Age sites are marked green. Nearly all these rock shelters eroded from Clarence Formation sandstone at its contact with the Elliot. To a lesser extent, shelters formed in shales of the Echo Group. The sky blue on the inserted geological map represents the Natal group and Sabudu was sculpted from these sandstones as the Utongati River chiseled its way to the sea. Border Cave is different because it is in the Labombo group and its shelter walls are rhyolite. The heritage sites that I have already referred to were awarded their status because of their immense contribution to knowledge in three specific contexts, provincial, national, and the broader global arena. In the case of KwaZulu-Natal province, the heritage agency determining provincial status is a MAFA. If a KwaZulu-Natal site is nominated for national status, status, it must first be awarded provincial status. The South African Heritage Resources Agency, SARA, reviews and administers national heritage sites and needs to be involved together with several other stakeholders in the nomination of a World Heritage Site. UNESCO reviews applications for World Heritage status. The small map on the bottom left shows the extent of the UNESCO World Heritage Site 
that is the Drakensberg Park. It is, of course, famed for its outstanding natural beauty, as well as its ecological and archaeological importance. The small Game Pass Rock Shelter Freeze is just one of more than 600 important rock art sites in the region. Some are in rock shelters of varying sizes, others are simply painted on unprotected rocks. The region encompassing the Utugela Basin is where Aaron Maisel excavated a great many later Stone Age sites. Each black dot represents one of these sites. I illustrate only two of them. In some cases, Middle Stone Age occupation occurred below later Stone Age, but by and large there seem to be fewer old sites at high altitude than there are in lower altitudes. Holly Shelter is in the Wartburg region. A large waterfall cascades over the cliff, and this tends to wet the sediments, so there is no organic preservation in the site. However, it has a beautiful stone tool assemblage. Many tools are made on horn fells, a rock sometimes called indurated shale, and there must be a good source of this material at a dolerite shale contact nearby. I make the assumption that the horn fell source is relatively close to Holly, yet Stone Age nappers are known to have transported desirable rocks and minerals for tens of kilometres. Bumbelli Belly is south of Durban, and the shallow rock shelter has deep sediments, incorporating both Pleistocene and Holocene occupations with Middle Stone Age and later Stone Age assemblages. Basal trimming on points like these is almost certainly a strategy for facilitating hafting. In the South African context, the style of manufacture appears restricted to KwaZulu-Natal, and it may represent a local tradition that expressed itself within a short period at the end of the Middle Stone Age. The distribution of the style implies interactions between people certainly south, north and west of modern-day Durban. The three sites where hollow-based points have been found are within a relatively short distance of each other, with Mbalibali and Sabudu about 100 kilometres apart and Mshlotazana between them, about 30 kilometres inland. Umschlotazana is well hidden in a forested kloof between Durban and Pietermaritzburg. The shallow overhang doesn't always protect the floor from the elements, so the sediments get damp and don't preserve either stratigraphy or organic material. The result is that some of the assemblages are mixed and some dates are inconsistent. The site contains both Middle Stone Age and later Stone Age occupations. Notwithstanding the contextual problems at the site, it is extraordinary because of its long record and its skillfully crafted stone tools. Its lithic sequence is similar to the one at Subudu, the site to be discussed shortly. So we know that Mshlotazana's Middle Stone Age occupations must have begun at about 80,000 years ago and that this Middle Stone Age technology continued until at least 35,000 years ago. The row of bifacial points at the base of the slide includes three serrated points that belong to a pre stolbe industry about 80,000 years old. These points were almost certainly a type of barbed spearhead. Serrated points lost favour in the stolbe and the upper row of tools shows some typical thin, slender points, including the still bay type fossil, the double-pointed foliate. An optically stimulated luminescence date confirms that Mshlotazana still bay occurred at about 70,000 years ago. The precisely worked serrations on the early points are evident in this close-up image. The site with a Middle Stone Age sequence most like that at Mshlotazana is Subudu, but unlike Mshlotazana, Subudu is a dry rock shelter 
and has good organic preservation, so it is possible to glean information from this site that is not exclusively derived from stone tools. Subudu has contributed to knowledge about the last 80,000 years in the area, its climate, vegetation and animal population. It has also provided much information about human life ways. It is consequently a national heritage site. But even before the declaration, a trust was set up to purchase land directly around the shelter to protect it from the large, low-cost housing development planned within 200 metres of it. The sediments excavated so far are about three metres deep and they contain Iron Age on the surface and Middle Stone Age directly beneath. The Middle Stone Age optically stimulated luminescence ages are between about 80,000 years ago at the present excavation base to about 35,000 years ago at the top. The late Rodney Maud often told me that Subudu's sequence would reach the Sangoan at 300,000 years ago. And who knows, perhaps he will still be proved right. At 80,000 years ago, craftspeople produced serrated points like those at Mshlatazana, and while this fashion was short-lived, bifacially worked points are common in much of the sequence. Subudu's stone tools have provided evidence for the early use of compound adhesives made from a variety of recipes. Chemical analyses have identified, for example, hematite and plant resin. Experiments with natural modern ingredients show that the addition to plant gum or resin of loading agents like hematite powder produce robust adhesives. Strong adhesives would have been important for hunting weapons like spears that are used at close range on dangerous animals. Ochre powder was produced in several different ways by grinding on coarse rocks or pounding with hammer stones. Many worked ochre pieces were found as well as thick deposits of ochre powder. Sometimes the processing took place on clean, hard ash surfaces. Ochre powder may have been exploited for many purposes. When it was mixed with milk obtained from a lactating bovid, it produced the earliest known tempera paint processed with the stone flake shown here. But I digress from my story about early adhesive. At about 65,000 years ago, the variety of adhesive recipes used for hafting small back tools, that is cutting implements deliberately blunted on one edge to enable hafting, allowed the flexible arrangement of the tiny tools at several different angles. This enabled the same tool template to be used for the creation of knives or arrowheads or even barbs as parts of composite hunting weapons. Very sharp, tiny quartz barbs that were occasionally notched were found in large numbers between 65,000 and 62,000 years ago. Barbs would have prevented a hunting weapon from being rubbed from its victim's wound. The contemporary presence of bone arrowheads at Subudu makes us confident that bone and arrow technology was known at least by 65,000 years ago, and perhaps a lot earlier. A great variety of weaponry may have existed at the time. Not only were there spearheads and stone arrowheads and barbs, but also these bone arrowheads rather like the ones used in the Kalahari in historic times. Bone was also used to make awls for hide piercing and small percussion tools for fine retouching at the conclusion of stone tool manufacture. The purpose of the notched bone on the right, 58,000 years old, is unknown, but it may have been a handle with notches to give traction to twine. Some researchers think that notched bones were counting devices. 
Sabudu's occupants made not only implements and weapons, but also ornaments. Pierced marine shells from species too small to have been a food source were recovered from a spatially restricted area in the 71,000-year-old Still Bay occupation. Perhaps the shells were strung as ornaments there, or maybe this was the spot where an ornament was lost. The shells may have been collected live from rock pools or dead from the sandy shore during low tide. Since sea levels were lower at 71,000 than during other Subudu occupations, people would have had to travel about 30 kilometers to collect the shells. Their transport back to Subudu was undoubtedly a very deliberate and probably planned action. An even greater surprise awaited us in the 77,000 year old layers. Here a sedge and grass bedding layer had been solidified and was preserved replete with bones from meals eaten there and tools laid out for use. Leaves from Cryptocaria woodii had been strewn across the surface of the bedding. The Cryptocaria aromatic leaves have insecticidal properties that would have been useful in a home base so close to a river. Since a single species of tree was represented, the placement of Cryptocaria leaves seems deliberate, not wind-induced. Species identifications made from wood anatomy preserved in charcoal from firewood burned in the past shows that many tree and shrub species grew near Sabudu. If leaves had simply been wind-blown, many species should have been represented on the top of the bedding. Climate and vegetation in the Sabudu region have been inferred from studies of seeds, charcoal, phytoliths, isotopes on charcoal, isotopes on tooth enamel from animals and sediments. All these studies have been published by specialists in the last 10 years. In brief, prior to 62,000 years ago, the Subudu cliff was heavily forested and yellowwood species dominated the charcoal in fireplaces. Notwithstanding this, the variety of taxa show that a mosaic of vegetation communities existed through the sequence. By 38,000 years ago, deciduous savanna was the most common vegetation type and plains game was hunted more often than other animals. In contrast, animals and birds preferring closed environments were targeted by hunters prior to 62,000 years ago. Interestingly, some pioneer plant and animal species were present at 58,000 years ago. This suggests that Subudu's sequence has the potential to reveal fine-grained environmental responses to temperature and precipitation changes. Cryptotephra shirts from the Tobri eruption at about 74,000 years ago have been found at Pinnacle Point, and sampling for shirts was supposed to take place at Sabudu and Border Cave in April 2020, but this research is now on hold. Qualitative analyses by Bongi Zwani of charcoal at Sabudu showed that fungus was present on the firewood dating 74,000 years ago. Bongi is now looking at the border cave charcoal to establish whether the same conditions applied there. Subtle rather than major environmental impacts may have been induced by Turba's volcanic winter. Border Cave is a national heritage site open to the public. It has a small museum at the car park and a curator guides visitors to the site. Border Cave has a longer occupation sequence than Subudu, and it was first occupied almost a quarter of a million years ago. It has exceptional organic preservation in its deep recesses, and it is a tragedy that it was largely laid bare before modern excavation techniques developed. It has been extensively excavated in the past, 
first by a team under Raymond Dart, then by Milan, Wells and Cook, and later by Peter Beaumont, who excavated a huge area. Now the site is being excavated by Backwell, Derrico and Wadley, assisted by a multidisciplinary team of specialists. Border Cave faces west from a well-wooded steep cliff in the scenic La Bombo Mountains. Our excavations from the back of the cave to its centre span the entire sequence from the earliest occupations before 227,000 to about 40,000 years ago. We're excavating small squares off the sides of the Beaumont Trench and our aim is to obtain fine resolution data, not large samples of material. The discoveries described here are from the oldest part of the sequence marked by the yellow star, and the area is shown in more detail in the next slide. In members 5BS and 4WA, dated by ESR on tooth enamel to between about 175,000 and 115,000 years ago, I recovered a large collection of charred rhizomes, deeper in the 227,000-year-old member, 5WA. I found traces of ephemeral silicified grass. I recognized this as plant bedding because of my work with similar but younger and better preserved bedding at Sabudu. This is one example of a charred rhizome from member 4WA. The surface splits are important because they demonstrate that the rhizomes were burnt while they were still fresh and moist. Splits were caused by shrinkage when moisture was rapidly expelled. Presumably people roasted the rhizomes in ashes and some were lost in the process. Roasting the starchy food makes it easier to digest by breaking down fibre and by releasing glucose so that the human gut can absorb it. We found 55 whole rhizomes and many fragments dated between 175,000 and 115,000 years ago. The process of identifying the border cave rhizomes involved first studying the morphology of modern geophytes, that is, bulbs, corms, tubers and rhizomes, and comparing it to the ancient rhizomes. Secondly, it involved studying rhizome anatomy, and we concentrated on vascular structure, root structure, and the calcium oxalate crystals that form in some but not all geophytes. Christine Sievers and I collected modern bulbs and rhizomes for four years, made vouchers and collected specimens for dissection. Live specimens were planted in my vegetable garden until we were ready to burn the underground parts to study their anatomy. Our comparative collection comprised fresh and charred geophytes. This is an example of how we processed them. We used a scanning electron microscope to examine both the modern and the ancient geophytes. Xylem vessels in modern hypoxus species best matched the ancient ones in the border cave specimens. Raphide bundles, that is the calcium oxalate crystals, in the border cave rhizomes also best matched those found in hypoxus species. Our long journey of exploration ended by making an identification of hypoxus angustifolia for all of the border cave specimens. This white fleshed hypoxus, colloquially called yellow stars, is palatable, has a high starch content, is gregarious, evergreen, and really widespread in Africa. This is the known distribution of hypoxus angustifolia, and interestingly, its distribution extends into Yemen, one of the routes thought to have been exploited by Homo sapiens leaving Africa. 
This is the ephemeral grass bedding that I mentioned earlier. It's in member 5WA, dated by ESR to 227,000 years ago. Intact blocks of bedding were removed by excavating around the features and raising them on sediment pedestals. Then the raised blocks were wrapped with wet chips and bandages and allowed to dry before removal. Stone tools like flakes, blades and small chips occur in the bedding. These demonstrate that people made and used the bedding and that various activities took place there. Small chips that are a byproduct of stone tool making are abundant and to show the spatial integrity of the feature, Paloma de la Peña refitted some fragments. See the image marked C. Plotting with a total station confirms that stone tools were made and used in and around the bedding. See the yellow dots in the insert on the right. Under the scanning electron microscope, a plant fragment extracted from a bedding block is convincingly a piece of grass. Using the SEM and phytolith studies by Irene Esteban, it's possible to see anatomical features like bilobate short cells, prickles, stomata, and leaf blade structures. These identify the border cave plant fragments as grass from the Panacoidae subfamily. One species, Panicum maximum, grows prolifically outside the cave. Sandra Lennox used wood anatomy of charcoal found on the bedding to identify the camphor bush Talcananthus. This aromatic species is still used by rural communities to repel insects. Maasai herdsmen make bedding from Talcananthus and burn its wood in their fires. Although the ancient bedding is ephemeral now, it may once have looked like this better preserved grass bedding from 50,000 years ago in member 2BS. See the image at the top. Throughout the border cave sequence, people often placed grass on ash layers. This was the case from the earliest bedding to that made 43,000 years ago in member 1WA. See the image below. Ash provides a clean, insulating surface, but ethnographies report further that ash can repel crawling insects and various parasites. Chemical testing was conducted on sediments and ash. Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy was carried out at the site by Marine Wojcik. Compounds from cave sediments include calcite, confirming the presence of ash. Research at Border Cave has shown the relative sophistication of hunter-gatherer lifeways before 200,000 years ago. Close to the origin of our species, people could produce fire at will. They used fire, ash and medicinal plants to maintain clean pest-free camps. They also collected plant food like hypoxis rhizomes and brought these together with portions of hunted meat to the home base to cook and share. Archaeological research of the kind I've introduced in this brief tour of rock shelters in KwaZulu-Natal can only be carried out successfully with multidisciplinary teams. Many skilled specialists have contributed to the results mentioned here, and I've not been able to mention each by name, nor do justice to their valuable work. I thank them all. Thank you very much for, for that. That was a fascinating tour of Can anybody hear me? You're loud and clear. Oh, okay, I just lost sight of myself on the screen for a moment. Thanks. 
Lynn, thank you so much for that. Um, are there any questions from the, the floor at this stage? Okay, well, I, I have one, Lynn. In the, your presentation, you mentioned there that the, the serrated um, knives or serrated points were pre-existing the, 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 the smooth ones. Why would they have stopped making serrated knives? I mean, in, in my kitchen, I've got both serrated knives and smooth sided ones. Did they just change for a particular reason or did they continue having both of them? Thanks for that question, Tanya. The serrated points were part of spear hunt. And the issue with spear hunting is that you have to directly be in contact with the animals you're hunting. Now that's an extremely dangerous process. It's, it's a sort of contact sport. Whereas once you've invented bow and arrow and you're using um, a more remote form of hunting, it's a much safer technique. But the arrows themselves are rather small and frail. So if you attach barbs to them, which are a sort of substitute for those serrations on the spearhead, then you have a very effective form of hunting weapon without the danger that goes along with spear hunting. Okay, thank you. That makes uh, a lot of sense. Anybody else have any comments, questions? Maybe just a general question for me. Um, is there any way of estimating what the human population of Southern Africa would have been at say 100,000 years or 80,000 years? Has there been any estimates made of that? We're not sure of the size of population. We do know that groups themselves probably would have been the sort of size that we get modern hunter-gatherer groups today, probably about 30 people in the average group. And maybe when there were aggregations, the groups would combine and um, the population would go up to about 60 in any given case. But we have no idea how many of such groups there would be around the country. And bear in mind that you know, archaeological work is, is relatively scarce. And so we are dependent on looking at the numbers of sites that have been recorded. And not all of those um, would be found. Some of them today would be underwater along the KwaZulu-Natal coast, for example. And so we don't really have an idea. The populations would have been, of course, considerably smaller than, say, 200 years ago. Um, Alan, yeah, I have a question if you don't mind. Go ahead, Alan. Um, you are referring to the use of fire with purpose. You mentioned that before the evolution of our species. Is, is that correct? Yes, we think that fire could have been controlled, that is, made its will, certainly from about 300,000 years ago, maybe 400,000 years ago, but perhaps not before that. The earliest evidence for fire in Africa was about one and a half million years ago in East Africa. But there, um, the fire was rather ephemeral and short-lived. And so it looked as though people extracted wildfire from lightning strikes, for example, and that they were able to curate the fire for a short while. But once the fire died, they couldn't reproduce it again. And the same thing applied a million years ago at Vondervac, where fire was found ephemerally in the site and not repeated in many of the occupations. By the time we get to 400,000, 300,000 years ago, there are hearts that are repeated in site, and it looks as like though people had learned how to perhaps use uh, rocks by striking them together to create a and that they could then make fire at any time that they, they would. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Going once, 
going twice. Sold. Lynn, thank you very, very much for this, this presentation. We thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, we'd like to invite everybody else to come back. We're not quite sure exactly when the, the next uh, lunchtime lecture is. Just keep an eye on the, the Google calendar and um, look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you very much. Craig, you can shut the meeting down, please.